how's it going everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this inning explain, we're looking at Seder. Following a broken family living secluded in a desolate forest who are observed by the demon Seder that is attempting to claim them. This is definitely a low budget one with the director doing pretty much the entire behind the scenes side of things by himself. But this still manages to create a very compelling, almost dreamlike story. Things unfold in a very confusing fashion, jumping around in time, characters pop up out of nowhere and disappear without any explanation. And a lot of the time you really just don't know what is going on. Then there's also the recordings throughout of Nanny discussing her experiences with Seder, and surprisingly these are real and completely improvised by the director's actual grandma. Just adds a whole other layer to things going on, and helps to make clear the dual purpose behind the story and what happens. So let's check out Seder, breaking down the story, including the several mysteries and lingering questions we're left with, just what the strange demon is all about, as well as explaining the ending and what it means. Nanny introduces us to Seder in her ramblings her ominously describing him as being in charge of everything. Way out in the mountains, someone is holed up in a cabin, and they start scribbling on some pages. They have quite a habit of it, seeing piles strewn around the room. Distorted whispers kick in, and the woman appears to be in a trance of some kind. We float through the house that is stuffed with candles over every square inch. In the middle of one display is a photo of a couple, and then we notice Grandma over in the corner. We float on to another room, where Mother is standing in a circle of even more candles. Gasoline is poured on someone's shoes, and a candle is dropped at their feet. We see it's not grandma, but the mysterious mother, who we learn almost nothing about. A fire roars deeper into the woods, and a wrapped up body is set ablaze. While it's never made quite clear, this opening and presumably all the black and white scenes are set in the past. In the present, one son Adam is living all by his lonesome, spending his time practicing with his rifle and wandering around with his dog. Sounds peaceful enough. He also listens to recordings of nannies, mainly her detailing more about Seder. He is in every place for those who fear him or or those who hope for his kindness and acceptance. Every beast of the forest, everything that moves, is his. He made a covenant of peace, and thusly seeks out harmful beasts in the land. They use Flash to cloak his disciples so they can live securely in the woods. He checks a deer cam, which has three images there, but they all only look like dark nothingness. He then starts to hear those strange whispers again, and sees that same kind of flame pyre in the forest from the opening. He's suddenly outside in his long johns, with his dog barking aggressively at whatever is out there. In the morning, he's blessed with some dog kisses, but he is already wide awake and looking quite distraught. In the woods, he discovers a broken branch on the ground, and then finds what looks like a bunch of branches purposefully assembled into a teepee sort of structure. Another random dude, actually his brother Pete, barges in and starts rummaging through the belongings. He pulls out a jar and gives it a big sniff before taking a grateful gulp. Mmm, moonshine, I'd imagine. The two never say a word as he fills up his flask with shaking hands. He finally looks at him in the eye, who only shrugs back what in response. He's looking on edge as well, mumbling about something he needs to get out of his head. They check the camera, and it's just another black frame, but Pete lends his expert opinion that the card must be messed up. Since the camera belongs to their grandpa Jim, they know he has a bunch of other gear back at their main house. Oh, and some beer too. Pete's definitely got alcohol related issues, right? On the drive, Pete addresses some of what has been unsaid. First, that he would put a shotgun in his mouth if he thought he would end up here like Adam, and scoffs, fucking Deborah, before chugging down more moonshine. Who's Deborah? I don't, you know, you don't know. He also brings up that if Adam would have just talked about Seder, the home would have accepted his ass. Well, it's really sounding like Adam has mental problems, especially in regards to believing in Seder, just as his grandmother did, and others in the family as well. As they arrive at the house, we're back to black and white, now making it seem kind of a jumble of the past and memories occurring in the present. They dig through some boxes and find some candles. Yeah, probably got a billion of those things lying around based on what we saw. Pete then chats with Nanny, who says she doesn't get up too much anymore. Her brain is dead, she moans. Pete agrees, mine too, and she chuckles, welcoming him to the crowd. She complains about losing her memory, though she does remember her husband dying. She can't remember when exactly, but does say she still misses him every day. Outside, Adam surprisingly runs into a random woman filling up a bird feeder. She introduces herself as Evie and asks if he needs any help or anything. Well, that was certainly strange. Who's this lady? Well, more on Evie later. Their supply mission is a success, picking up another cam and some beers. Somewhere in the trees, there are animal skeletons hung from branches as well as antlers. There's another assortment of furs splayed out nearby, which recalls Nanny's words about Seder's followers dressing themselves in skins. He puts on another tape with Nanny, describing what happens when you summon the demon. Once doing so, he turns his attention to you, and you must submit yourself to trust him completely. You will be tested by affliction, for he is consuming fire. After you have suffered, he will refine you. He looks longingly to the family together, and it's sounding like Mother is the one who summons Seder 
year prior. Adam wakes up to some clattering and the lamp won't click on. He retrieves a flashlight, scanning around the pitch black environment. The outdoors are so dark, the light can't even penetrate it. The black takes us over and his dog starts barking that it spooks him good. He finds it angrily scratching and barking at the door. He swings it open and the dog bolts off into the forest and we spot a small light off in the distance, just a little glowing dot in the dark. We jump back into his jammy dream, encountering the fire once more. He starts getting closer, the wind whistling in the trees, and he gasps awake. It's certainly looking like whether he intended to or not, Adam is now on Seder's radar. He sets out into the forest to find his pup, but to no avail. Ominous looking clouds roll in, and we see one star up in the sky that weirdly zips out of sight. Uh, see ya, I guess. I don't know if stars did that. And when Whistling does hear something else out there, but he's not so sure what. He checks the deer cam again, and as usual, it's just another single shot of what appears to be an empty forest. Back with Nanny and Pete, she doesn't even recognize him at this point. He reminds her that he's her grandson, and she has some vague recollection, though says he has grown up quite a lot. Turns out he was actually there yesterday, and a strange shadow appears in the door. It's just Adam, who enters and films around the house, then coming to his mom with her papers all over the place. Nanny fills us in further on what she believes regarding Seder, calling him her guardian. This entity in her brain that tells her things to write. There's a voice in her head that is actually talking to her, saying that it knows what people are doing and saying as well as what has to be done. Well, it sounds like Seder's got it covered. According to her, Seder actually trained her to be a better person. Every once in a while, he would appear to her in bed even, and she found that Seder cares for her in a way, but also admits that all of this makes her sound totally nuts. Now we're starting to get that kind of dual layer to Seder. It's potentially a demon that can speak in people's minds, but it also represents mental issues. Nanny definitely has dementia, and this voice could be seen as a sign of schizophrenia. Adam enters the hall with a rifle and stares down to Nanny, looking quite vegetative in bed. Maybe this was late than what we just saw? She mentions that Seder made her do things from time to time, but eventually he left her on her own. He comes to Evie in the other room and explains that his dog ran off. She apologizes and is concerned that something might have injured him. He's then suddenly back in bed, and Annie continues that she still does hear from Seder. He'll come and tell her what she or other people are doing, and sometimes still leaves her little messages. Pete makes it clear that he is not a fan of Seder, saying that he can fuck right off. But Adam doesn't know what else to do here, truly thinking that this demon has somehow taken taken Nanny and their mother hostage. Pete finds it interesting what the brain chooses to lash onto and reminisces about a memory of helping Grandpa Jim build a cabin. Or so he thought, as what he was actually remembering was just a photograph, not anything from his memories, and he realizes then that he didn't actually remember the day at all. Then he brings up the ever-elusive Evie, and he can't remember her or the accident, but he does know they were messed up most of the time, so perhaps that's why he doesn't remember. There's no other real mention of what happened to Evie outside of this offhand remark, but it sounds like they were possibly drinking too much and that she might have gotten killed in a car wreck or something. That would at least fit with what we know so far. Seder has a particular path to purification involving a trial by fire, and he will first send a messenger to your temple. Worried about the impending messenger potentially showing up, Adam gets his gun at the ready. Then he hears a clattering. He tiptoes to the door while Nanny narrates his situation. Are you ready to have dominion over every living thing? And join Seder as one of his disciples. He also is particular to burnt offerings, so keep that in mind. He sets down the gun and steps out into the insanely dark outdoors. He finds Evie out there asking about his dog again. She tells him she has something for him that was hidden at his grandmother's, and he invites her inside to flip through a book of pictures. There's mention of the accident again, her glad that Pete made it out okay at least. Then they come to a photo of Mother with her favorite papers, and based on what Evie says, she mysteriously vanished one day without a trace. She says that she can relate as well, and luckily she had Pete to lean on. As for Adam and Pete, it sounds like it was Deborah of the siblings that helped keep them together. Evie hopes one day they can all be reunited once more, and her voice gets drowned out by more whispers. The front door swings open to that little pinhole of light as the voices grow louder and more intense. It's worth pointing out that his visitor has once more just disappeared out of the trace, just as Pete also seems to do. This really calls into question everything we've been seeing, and adds to that whole dreamlike feel of things. Adam busts out his dust-covered laptop, and when he plops down to take a seat, is surprised by a figure donned in an animal's skull mask and fur. They sit motionless as he walks around them with his gun trained. He lowers the weapon and notices that they have something clutched in their hands, what looks like a printout from the shot on his deer cam. Nanny's voice crackles in on the radio, telling him that Seder knows everything about him and his ways. If you were to lay a hand upon him, such knowledge would be too wonderful for you to attain. The disciple shuffles to the front door and removes their masks, so he goes in for a closer look, seeing at some lady with a shaved head. Uh... 
who is that? I don't know. I can't tell if it's their mom. I, I don't know. I'll have to do a side by side. That's the only thing that makes sense. But they, again, they don't even say like, oh, hey, mom. And it's hard to identify her because she's only in like two scenes in the whole movie. Who am I talking to? Then he continues that nothing will remain secret as Sator reveals all that is profound and hidden. As she mentions being able to see what's in the darkness, they slide over the picture. The lantern blows out and when he grabs his flashlight, the person has disappeared. He runs outside and there is no sign of her. And we know there's no way that she was that quick. This really makes it clear that reality cannot be trusted. If he was going cuckoo bananas, then that would all make sense. More on that later. Pete returns and helps Adam futilely search one last time for his pup. Here we also get the closest thing to any kind of confirmation about what the hell is even going on here. Pete says he truly believes that Grandpa Jim sacrificed himself so that Mom could be with Sater, and even thinks that Nanny was involved. This all does track with the few clues that we've been presented with so far, with Mom disappearing and Nanny always going on about old Sater. We also know that he needs a sacrifice of some kind, and it sounds like Jim was willing to fill this role to get his daughter what she wanted, to be with Sater for good. Be involved wearing animal skins judging people in the forest. They hike back to the truck, and somehow, before returning home, Pete's gone again. Adam pulls out a picture, but doesn't want to dwell on the past, and tosses it into the fireplace. There he finds something already stowed inside, the same photo book that Evie brought to him. Back to the past, the footage now even more closely resembles old home videos, with the family gathered for Adam's birthday. There is one family member absent, mother, but they all know that they won't be able to get her out of her dang room. Deborah decides to try anyway, finding her poring over Nanny's writings, and reciting what we heard earlier about the messenger visiting your temple, implying that she has started the same kind of summoning thing Adam has. Mother immediately gets angry when noticed and slams the door in Deborah's face. Pete groans that they need to burn those writings, and we learn that already back then, Adam too is suffering from issues. They mention something about taking him to see Evie, but are worried about him being around so many people. He's sitting out on the porch in a daze, not even responding when Debbie calls his name. A hand on the shoulder snaps him out of it, and she has to know, where does he go? when he's like that? Is he hearing a voice like Nanny and their mom? He glumly nods yes, but doesn't reply when she wants to know if it is Sater specifically. Still engrossed in the photos and memories, he's interrupted by thudding footsteps approaching at the door. The sounds continue, and it definitely sounds like someone is right outside. The door opens, and Adam backs away in terror, but nothing comes. The bangs move on to the front door, sending him back out into the dark woods. Shining his light around, he surprisingly comes to a woman tied up to a tree. We see that it's Evie, and upon seeing Adam, she grows frightened and tries to run. He grabs her and starts choking her, but then almost catches himself, suddenly realizing what he's doing and lets her loose. She again tries to flee, and he chases after. After a brief hot pursuit, Evie shrieks and is lifted into the air, disappearing completely. He's flabbergasted and tries to look around the area for any kind of reasonable explanation. And yeah, I don't think so, bud. Animal shrieks echo in the forest, and he sees another skin nearby on a tree. The older lady is there, too, staring creepily right at him. Hi, Mom. He lies listless in bed, repeatedly clicking his dead lamp. He decides to ultimately go forward with the dangerous summoning by, you guessed it, setting up a shitload of candles around the place. That photo of the woods left behind sends him back to check the deer cam, and it once more appears to be nothing but darkness. Perhaps remembering that idea of Seder exposing hidden truths, Adam maxes out the brightness, exposing several hidden disciples amongst the trees. That's right, they're coming for you. They make good quickly on their promise, strolling right in through the front door. He hides just out of sight as several of them walk right by. He decides to make a break for it, running off into the night. He doesn't get too far without them noticing, hearing the creatures howling nearby. He keeps running until he can't anymore, and sits down to catch his breath. He's happened upon a waterfall, along with more of those kind of branch structures. Deeper inside the cave, a light flickers, and the whispers take over. Adam is compelled to enter, and comes to a disciple in the cave wielding the flame. Out of the darkness, another figure appears higher up on a throne, and bathed in a holy light. It must be the big man, demon guy, Seder himself. He purposefully lifts his hand, seeing that each finger is made of animal parts. And that's it, as we abruptly jump to Adam stomping his way through a snowy landscape. Yep, even the weather just straight up changed out of nowhere. The timeline only gets murkier now as we return home, but this time it's not in black and white and square ratioed, implying this happened more recently than the other memory scene, or could be going on right now. Deborah confronts her nanny about the automatic writings fueled by Seder's voice, as well as the others in her head. Did her mom hear 
near them too? Was she trying to join them? She wants to know. Nanny considers that it is a strong possibility, saying the new disciples are chosen from the furnace of their afflictions. Don't forget to do an offering by fire before your purification either. Seder loves the sweet burning smell. Mm -hmm. And Debbie is like, oh, speaking of sacrifices, do you remember the day that Grandpa Jim died? She does recall a bit, including that he was just as invested in Seder as his daughter. They had discussed his dying somewhere before, so they actually had plans revolving around his death. Then one day, he just walked out of the house and laid down in the grass and died. That's where he was found later. Really makes it sound like he was a sacrifice, as Pete suggested. He could have been the wrapped up person that was set ablaze. Jim's death also caused Pete to spiral, and he got into trouble with Evie, learning that he's been in a home for a while. Again, it sounds like the accident resulted in her death, and was caused by his alcohol abuse, hence getting sent to a treatment facility. Either way, he's definitely got a drinking problem, that's for sure. She psychs Nanny up to show Pete support for all the work that he's put in to get better, knowing how important it is to Pete. He's then out by the water in the winter, first time we've seen him there. He trudges off towards his truck, and then wonders if hearing voices is genetic. And he's told, well, he didn't hurt anybody. Pete argues with Deborah that Mom didn't either, and she gets incensed. If you still try to blame Seder for what happened, she'll put him right back into treatment, she threatens. He also wants to see Adam, which she immediately shuts down. Pete just feels bad for leaving him out there, presumably in the cabin as we've seen, but she reminds him that it isn't safe for Adam to be around them, and she made the decision to send him off to the cabin. It's really starting to sound like there's a kind of cycle going on with the family, with, as Pete brought up, is hearing voices hereditary. Just as Nanny and their own mother before, the boys have inherited their own respective troubles, and for Adam, it sounds like things got concerning enough they basically had to banish him off into the woods. He goes out for a cigarette and declines his sister's wanting to join, kind of rejecting her in a way, in relation to what he said earlier. She seems to be the most stable of the family and is doing her best to keep things from completely falling apart. In spite of her urging, he also decides to take a drive out to the cabin. There he finds a fire going, but after searching the place, it looks like Adam is not around. He settles in and goes right for the moonshine, giving it his customary sniff, but this time he refuses the drink, which makes it start to feel like what we were seeing earlier was seeing things from Adam's perspective. Like, of course his brother's gonna be drinking constantly. That's his whole hangup, you know? While perhaps in reality, Pete really was rehabilitated, especially after the vague trauma he experienced involving Evie. Speaking of, while Pete is preoccupied with a family photo, she appears there in the chair. Another person in Long John's is there behind him and jams him with a set of antlers. He's let loose and tumbles headfirst into the fireplace, causing his beard to catch on fire. They jam his face right up in there. Well, there's your offering via fire, huh? Pete lies in a smoldering heap on the ground and someone else with blood on their torso starts to levitate in the air. Okay? Back at home, Deb is sitting at a table alone and is drawn away by wood creaking. It's Nanny and someone else is there with her. She asks if she's ready for bed and Nanny starts shambling towards what we see now is the newly recruited disciple, Adam. Deb does some dishes and comes out later and is surprised to see that Nanny has vanished. Looks like she was taken by Seder just like she wanted. Deb sets out into the night and runs right into her bald brother who just stares at her. She whimpers with a tear in her eye and he violently attacks her just as with Evie. She's there watching too as Deb collapses to the ground. They take out some gasoline and pour it over her feet before setting her on fire. Just like we saw in the beginning part, Deb groans hysterically as the fire climbs her body. And the others step aside to get a better viewing angle. Amongst the flames, we see the upside down lady that looks like their mother, along with several other masked disciples. Adam enters the family home and comes to the same hallway from his memories earlier. Down the way is a bald lady in bed, along with his dog. Oh, there he is. He enters another room where Nanny is sitting along with another satyr fan, and he decides to join the gang. They all slowly turn to face us, and Nanny's voice comes back on. I don't know how to explain it. Seder's been giving me these messages that land in my head. So will other people if they want it, and brings up how Mother said similar things to her. When it comes to being good and not being good, Seder knows the score. So in the end, they all fall victim to Seder. The family has been completely claimed. That's the surface level takeaway, considering that Nanny was actually in contact with this evil spirit, and that set into motion them getting targeted and eventually taken. Or when it comes to Adam, it's his mom and nanny. They actually chose to go with Seder rather than just being straight up killed as we saw with Pete and Deborah. This could be because the other siblings never actually heard the voice while the others definitely did. It's implied that Adam is going through with the summoning to find their missing mom, but in doing so, he brought Seder right to their door. But then there's that important through line regarding mental health, and based on what we see, Adam was definitely having issues there too. I still think there's something important to that moment where he uncontrollably chokes Evie. She immediately is scared when seeing him, unlike like all the other times where she was just like, eh, eh. I suspect that this is there to show us that there is another side of Adam that we don't really see much of. He usually just kind of 
mopes around. But Deb also specifically says she made the decision to exile him to the cabin due to his behavior. This implies there's a lot more going on there than we really ever see. So taking this into consideration, it also makes sense that what we're seeing is actually all just presented via Adam's jumbled mind. That would explain the jumping around in time and the randomly appearing people and all that stuff. Is because what we're being presented is Adam's losing his touch with reality. This way, Seder comes to represent their mental illness itself. They live in fear that it will come for them, and ultimately you cannot escape it. This ties back into the real life aspect with the director's grandma and her stories about Seder. Apparently during the initial production, they got grandma for what was supposed to be a quick little cameo, and she surprised them with her story about the demon that has been in her head since way back in the 1960s. His grandma was actually afflicted with dementia, and he had no idea about any of this until this moment. No doubt this revelation had a huge impact on Graham, and he set out on his own deep dive into his previously unknown family history. Amongst them, he discovered a lineage of family illness, and certainly this would create a big fear in his mind. And we see that definitely reflected in Adam and his journey. Can I escape the past, or am I doomed to repeat it? Well, based on the cycle stuff we see going on here, yeah, you're kind of screwed. With that, we've reached the conclusion of this inning explained for Seder. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Seder and its ending? What do you think it all means? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching, Foundflix. See you next time. Hail Seder.